certain extraordinary men whose thinking was infused with passion, whose philosophies have changed the world. Alexander Zuckercandle, MD, PhD, was perhaps the greatest philosopher of our 20th century. As Aristotle was to antiquity, as Aquinas was to the Middle Ages, so Zuckercandle is to modern times. The influence of Zucker Candle has been such that we are all his followers, whether we know it or not. Of these followers, none is more ardent than our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Robert M. Hutchins. It was Dr. Hutchins' good fortune many years ago, while he was president of the University of Chicago, and therefore had nothing to do, to discover the great Dr. Zucker Candle and his work. It is our pleasure to present to you now the foremost authority on Dr. Alexander Zucker Candle, his dedicated disciple, his closest, his only friend, the Honorable Robert Maynard Hutchins. I shall read to you a work in which I've been engaged for the last seven or eight years. That's why the manuscript is so frayed. It is entitled, Living Without Guilt. It is by Alexander Zucker Candle, MD, PhD, with an introduction that I have written, explaining the story of his life and my association with him and the main themes of the great work to which his life was devoted. It was in a small cafe in Baden-Baden many years ago that I first encountered my late friend, Alexander Zucker Candle, whose penetrating analysis of the cause and cure of the ills of our time I have the honor to communicate to the world. The only feature that distinguished him from the other habitués of the cafe or saloon was a small goatee, an adornment that he wore in memory of his teacher, Sigmund Freud. He welcomed me to his table with a remark that I took to be friendly. No. You, Kindlach, Kamish. I couldn't be sure because it was couched in a language with which I was not familiar. I discovered later that it was the dialect of his native village of Adel in Austria. Adel in the census of 1955 numbered 397 souls, or as the citizens are called, adolescents. <laughs> It was in this dialect of Adel that my friend habitually spoke and wrote, not that he had to. He was proficient in several languages, including German. At our first meeting, Dr. Zuckercandel said nothing without being asked, and nothing when asked except yo. Yo. Oh, yo. Oh, no. Which in Adlian means yes, yo. and no, yo. which in Adlian means no. Yo. Until I discovered the cause of his taciturnity, I suspected that he was following the maximum of his favorite poet. Das Beste, was du wissen kannst, darfst du den Buben doch nicht sagen. Das Beste, was du wissen kannst, darfst du den Buben doch nicht sagen. Don't tell the boobs all you know. <laughs> but I was under his spell. In spite of the rather inferior quality of the beer, I returned night after night to the little cafe. On our last night there together, Dr. Zucker Candle, after consuming a case and a half of beer, led the group in singing the old oddly and folk song, Silver Threads Among the Gold. Liebchen Lion is fair to help. Zilbern Faden, Mr. Gelt, shining off my paint to Leben fart is hot and tin Doch mein Liebchen, du wirst sein, immer frisch and fair and fine. Yo, mein Liebchen. Do be a sign, never find one rhyme, one mine. I shall never forget what a figure he made standing there amid the empty can. <laughs> now the question is, how could this little man, 
Dr. Zuckerkind. He was only five feet two and he weighed but seven stone. A stone is 14 pounds. Graduates of American high schools will therefore be able to figure out that Zuckerkind will weigh around 100. <laughs> Now, how could this, how could this little man, I ask, single-handed, break the chains that have bound us and pass beyond them into the clear, calm, pure air of Zucker Candleism? <laughs> Other men had built systems. Others had told their fellows how they ought to live. They had all failed for one simple reason. They had wanted to change mankind. Zucker Candleism proceeds from a far sounder premise. It supplies mankind with the reasons for doing what it is doing already. At one stroke, Zucker candleism rids us of those guilt feelings and complexes which, as we all know, are at the bottom of our private and public troubles. Our aim in life, our aim in life, says Dr. Zucker Candle, is to get through it. Ah, you. <laughs> A leading American thinker of the 19th century seems to have had some perception of this truth. Bill Nye said, I rise from bed the first thing in the morning, not because I am dissatisfied with it, but because I cannot carry it with me during the day. <laughs> Our aim in life is to get through it without pain. You, you, you. Freud said, all pain is sensation. His genius did not carry him to the inside of Zucker Candle. All sensation is pain. Uh -huh. Emerson's inkling of this insight peeps out through the cloak of metaphor. If we walk in the woods, we must feed mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> pain can be the object of the good life as well as pleasure. Pleasure is pain, and pain is pleasure, and since there is no difference between them, they are equally bad. Orientalisch and flippin' flabbin. As Freud said, the only reason that we feel pain is that we feel it. <laughs> Our aim in life is therefore to get through it without sensation. Ach, yo, yo! <laughs> If Zucker Candle had stopped here, his analysis would have influenced the whole future course of philosophical speculation. He didn't stop. He pressed on. He tells us what to do. He shows us how to do it. With Zucker Candle to guide us, we can face life as Mark Twain recommended, with the serene confidence that a Christian feels in four races. And with... <laughs> And we can face life with the composure of the man who said to his wife, if one of us dies, I shall move to Paris. <laughs> How can we avoid sensation and become unconscious? By habit. Habit is the road to our goal, which is a disentangled life. Routine living is habitual living. Habitual living is unconscious living. For a small child, tying a shoelace is a feat of engineering. After we have learned and practiced the trick, we can't remember having performed it. We perform these actions unconsciously because we perform them habitually. It follows that as far as possible, we should perform all acts habitually and hence unconsciously. You, you. You. Here we encounter the massive underlying error of Freud. In his last major work, Freud says that psychoanalysis is built on the attempt to make people conscious of their unconscious. Zucker Candle shows that Freud had it just backwards. <laughs> the task is not to make people conscious of their unconscious, but to make them unconscious of their conscious. This is the path to the disentangled life to happiness. One reason the unconscious life is the modern life is that it is the scientific life. Scientific knowledge is the only knowledge that is knowledge of fact. It is not based on thought, but on experiment and empirical observation. Scientists do not think. They observe. Therefore, they do not make errors of thought. The only errors they can make are errors of observation. And these are immediately corrected by further observations. <laughs> Therefore, we may have confidence in science.
<laughs> These propositions, life has a purpose, or let us now be up and doing. Boofancy? Or little children love one another. Boofin? Are absolutely meaningless because they are absolutely unverifiable in the laboratory. The attempts that have been made to verify moral propositions scientifically have all failed. One of the most elaborate of these was conducted by Professor Petrum Sorokin of the Harvard Institute of Altruism. <laughs> Professor Sorokin made a study of the lives of over, over 3,000 saints honored by the Protestant, Catholic, and Eastern Orthodox churches. It showed that they lived an average of 61 years, much longer than their fellow men, in spite of the fact that 27% of them had been martyred very young, many of them at a tender age. It is well known that the saints were the juvenile delinquents of their day. They were tough. Naturally, they lived longer. So we need not be surprised at the outcome of recent studies conducted by a professor at the Harvard School of Business who has examined the mortality records of 3,000 Chicago gangsters and has shown that they lived an average of 62 years in spite of the fact that 28% of them had been martyred very young <laughs> many of them at a tender age. I will now show you why you ought to be unconscious. If I do not do this, you will feel guilty, and the prime object of this work is to point the way to living without guilt. Why do we feel guilt? Because of the gnawings of conscience, what used to be called the agon bite of inwit. Das Ingeweisen Seitgebissen. Now, where does the agon bite come from? Religion tells us it comes from Adam and Eve. By Adam's fall, we sinned all. According to Freud, we have within us a harsh taskmaster, which he calls the superego. The superego is a 19th century University of Vienna name for the doctrine of original sin. The superego turns out to be nothing but Adam and Eve in costumes from the Flater Mouse. <laughs> <clears throat> but wait, as Julius Rosenwald, a great American, once said, the secret of business success is when you've got a lemon, make a lemonade out of it. <laughs> Let us take these two lemons, original sin and the superego, and see if we can wring something nourishing from them. The agon bite of inwit. Proponents of original sin and the superego have mistaken the nature of the agon bite. The agon bite is simply what people will say. Because of your faulty upbringing, you say, I will not commit murder, rape, arson, burglary, or other rascalities because of the agon bite of inwit. What you mean is, I will not do any of these things because of what people would say. It is not conscience that you fear, but a dismal, universal hiss, the sound of public scorn. Now we are on sound ground. The only true morality, therefore, is amorality, because amorality eliminates choice. Through habit and conformity, the moral question is erased. Ah, yo, yo! Imagine, then, a community all the members of which are unconscious. Let neither choice nor thought nor action destroy this paradise, this nest of softly cooing doves, unconcerned by what people will say, because they know that people will all say the same thing. Be unconscious, be detached, don't get involved. As the Shakers used to say, leave the flurry to the masses, take your time, and shine your glasses.